lecture since his student life and at present is a schedule of, of Abin. As the time now is 11 o'clock, uh, my watch is 10 minutes past, so now we have 11 o'clock. And to become a moderator is not an easy task because we have five speakers and we have to allocate them enough sufficient time to share their views. But perhaps, I think, with the limited time that we have, and of course we have, I would like to thank the participants, as Tony said, this is the big crowd. Uh, some of them came as early as 8.30 this morning. I think we also got to give some space for the participants to have the, uh, their views and also to ask questions to the panelists. And because of that, I only allow for every speaker to, to, to give their views within 15 minutes. Let us begin with the first speaker, Professor Dr. Chandra Muzaffar. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Yang amat berbahagia Tuhan Yang berbahagia Prof. Hashim Kamali Yang berbahagia Dr. Muhammad Azam Fellow panelists, friends Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Waalaikumsalam Salam sejahtera, peace be with you It was the persecution of the Rohingyas in Myanmar, which made many of us aware of the crisis in ethnic relations which Myanmar is confronted with. The Rohingyas, described by the United Nations as perhaps one of the most persecuted minorities in the world, have suffered a great deal at the hands of the regime in Myanmar. But they're not the only ones. Others have also suffered. There are other Muslims, apart from the Rohingyas, who have suffered at the hands of this regime. There are minorities who have suffered at the hands of this regime, Shans, the Parents, the Chins. And even the majority community has also suffered at the hands of this regime. What is the root problem in Myanmar? It is basically the nature of the regime. It's a military regime, it is harsh, it is cruel, it's even brutal and barbaric. That is the root problem. The Rohingyas and uh, the others, including the majority Burmans, are victims. Is it true, friends, that uh, things are beginning to change in Myanmar? That this military regime is beginning to change? Now you have a former general as the president of Myanmar who appears to have made some changes and there are changes which no one can deny. You have had elections, parliamentary elections in Myanmar, Aung San Suu Kyi, the icon of freedom in Myanmar has been released from prison, from house arrest. A number of other political prisoners have been released, it's true. There have been changes to the economy. The regime has been more open to foreign investments, to a certain degree of free enterprise. All this is true. But the fact remains that the regime is still very much a regime with a military mindset. That is the truth. Which means that 
these changes that have taken place should be seen against the backdrop of this military mindset. The changes are perhaps an attempt to help perpetuate the life of the regime. Perhaps that's what it is. Perhaps these changes will not bring about fundamental transformations in Myanmar society. Which may explain the situation of the growing years. Because it's a regime that believes in control and dominance and continues to be harsh, you find that this regime is not prepared to guarantee the safety and security of the Rohingya minority. It is not prepared to concede on the most fundamental challenge facing the Rohingyas, their most fundamental aspiration to be regarded as citizens of Myanmar. They were citizens at one time, but after 1982, they had been stripped of their citizenship, the majority of Rohingyas. And that is their most fundamental aspiration, to be received and regarded as citizens. And the regime is not prepared to concede on this at least up to this point. How do we change the attitude of the regime? As someone who is not part of Myanmar society, as someone living outside here in Malaysia, but someone who is part of ASEAN, an ASEAN citizen, I think ASEAN has a responsibility to try to bring about a change. <coughs> We would like to see ASEAN governments adopt a more proactive approach to the question of the Rohingyas in Myanmar and of the other minorities. We would like ASEAN governments to pressurize their fellow ASEAN government to bring about the changes that are needed. And how will this happen? I do not think the governments will want to pressurize the government in uh, Myanmar without the civil society groups in various ASEAN countries playing their role. This to my mind is what is most critical. Civil society groups will have to play their role in pressurizing their respective governments. They should place this as an important item on their respective agendas. Civil society groups all over ASEAN. Tell their governments, convey this message to the government in Myanmar that you cannot continue to do this. I think civil society groups have not done enough. We have not done enough. We have endorsed petitions, we have done a bit of networking, we have collected donations, we have done things like that. Perhaps we should do more to pressurize our respective governments to act on the question of the Rohingyas and other minorities. I just come from a meeting in Bangkok just two days ago, which focused upon Buddhist Muslim ties in Asia. It's part of a long dialogue we've had for decades. But this dialogue, at this particular point in time in Bangkok, initiated by the International Network of Engaged Buddhists, whose leaders would be known to many of us, and just together with an international interfaith organization called Religions and Peace, we held this dialogue. And one of the very important issues that we discussed was, of course, Myanmar and the situation of the Rohingyas. Something which was a revelation to me was how the Rohingya issue 
is now beginning to have a spillover effect in other ASEAN countries. And this, to my mind, is a dangerous sign. In Indonesia, for instance, there have been clashes between Muslims and Buddhists in certain places, partly because of this issue. And here we know in Malaysia, there have been uh, perhaps some clashes, gang fights within the Myanmar community, but between Muslims and Buddhists. And given the fact that in Malaysia, we have a fairly substantial Buddhist minority, a Muslim majority, who have lived in peace for such a long while, we have not had problems. But once things like this begin to happen, you have to become very, very careful and cautious. There could be a spillover effect. So this is the danger, the danger of a spillover effect. Other ASEAN countries where you have Muslims and Buddhists living side by side. And we must do what we can to prevent this, which is why I think it is so important for us in ASEAN to speak up now and say, let's try to resolve this problem. You must resolve the root of the problem, which is the question of citizenship, which is the question of the nature of the regime in Myanmar. I want to conclude by saying this, friends, that for us in Southeast Asia, in the ASEAN region, this is a matter of tremendous urgency. We must understand this. We must resolve this issue. We have to resolve this issue through non-violence, through peaceful methods, through diplomacy, through politics, not through violence. It is not by arming a particular group or trying to strengthen some militant groups that we will resolve this issue. We will not be able to resolve this issue in that manner because that's going to make the situation worse. Let's understand this. It has to be through diplomacy, it has to be through peaceful means. We have to act, we have to pressurize, we have to persuade, we have to coax the people in power to pay much greater attention to this issue and try to resolve it. For me, the most compelling reason for resolving this is, I think Muslims and Buddhists in ASEAN, in Asia, throughout the world, perhaps offer the best hope of nurturing a spiritual, moral renaissance for the whole of humanity, these two communities. They have a lot in common in terms of certain shared values, certain ethical principles, even if on certain fundamental issues we are different and uh, we should not hide the fact that we are different when it comes to certain issues. But nonetheless, in terms of a fundamental spiritual and moral perspective on life, there are similarities. And it is so important that these two communities work, work together and there is no better region in the world for them to work together than in ASEAN. Why? Because it's in ASEAN that you have these two big communities. A big Muslim community and a big Buddhist community. And if we don't work together, then we are going to suffer together. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Professor Chandra Mazafa. I think uh, you indeed uh, presented less than 50 minutes. I'm expecting you to uh, to share with us more than 50 minutes. <laughs> but anyway, I think one of these things that uh, Prof. Chanda Muzaffa uh, I mean, to point is to, to, to seek the cooperation of, from the ASEAN uh, member. Perhaps our political secretary from ASEAN, uh, I mean, uh, organizations could take this into consideration 
and also how this uh, Prof. Chala Muzaffar has asked we, the civil society, to work harder. Uh, I mean, the, this, um, as Prof. Chala Muzaffar said, that this uh, Muslim Buddhist dialogue that was taking place in Thailand recently, and we share lots of fundamental things in common. And I suppose that by having this moral and spiritual perspective where we share in common, we can uh, perhaps solve this problem. Uh, without further ado, that we